when I was about to graduate, um, I took the newspaper entrance examination for the Yomiuri Shimbun, which is the world is actually the largest newspaper in the world with 10 million readers. Um, newspapers in Japan, the, there are five na national newspapers with local with local supplements, making it a very interesting business model. Um, they all hire almost at the same time. They hire by having examinations. So I think there were about 3,000 people, maybe 4,000. Uh, let's say let's say 3,000 to be conservative. That uh, that took the examination that year. They hired 60. I was one of the people that made it through the uh, examinations and the three interviews. And then they put me on the police beat in the sort of New Jersey of Japan, um, the equivalent of maybe Canberra. No, no offense to Canberra. Um, you know, not, not a lot happening there, kind of a bed town. Uh, and that's pretty much where I stayed for the first four years of my career, on the police beat. And within the police beat, we actually had so many people covering crime. Not that there's a lot of crime in Japan, but because there's so little, every crime becomes a big deal, especially murder, things like that. I covered organized crime. Uh, most of my 12 years as a reporter in Japan were covering organized crime. And even after I left the newspaper, um, I took a job sponsored by the U.S. State Department um, to do a, an intense study of human trafficking in Japan. Uh, and of course that involves the Yakuza, J Japan's mafia as well. So when I think about it, I've probably been dealing with or writing about Japanese organized crime for 17 years now. You know, that's a, very, a far cry from what I originally intended to do, which was be a, a Zen Buddhist priest. Japanese culture is about reciprocity and respect. Um, that means that if you say you're going to do something, you're going to do it. Um, and if you don't do it, then people won't trust you. Uh, there's a saying in Japanese, a samurai never has a second word, meaning that once he said it, he's going to do it. Um, in Japan, you show your respect to people, and if they do something for you, you repay that. If you understand that and you do that, if you make a small promise and you keep it, very soon you will have a good relationship with a Japanese person. But if you make a small promise and you don't keep it, uh, they take note. Um, so reciprocity is the core of Japanese um, society, as is respect. It's embedded in the language. Um, whenever I speak to someone in, J in Japan, one of the reasons we do the business card exchange is I have to know what his status is next to mine so that I can figure out whether to address him in the, you know, as my superior or my inferior or my equal. Uh, Japanese society exists on the, the premise we are not equals. And actually, that's the truth. Uh, in the United States, we don't acknowledge that we have a class system. Uh, we call everybody by their first name. But there's definitely uh, you know, a social strata there. In Japan, you have to acknowledge it to speak Japanese correctly. Uh, that may be hard for some foreigners to take, to sort of humble yourself and say, you know, and treat someone as they're your superior. But in Japan, you have to acknowledge that. And if you acknowledge that, you can get along. There's very little street crime in Japan because Japanese crime is very organized. And Yakuza members are kicked out if they engage in mugging or robbery or burglary or anything that is you know, of the nature of Glasgow thugs. That is not allowed. Uh, even these days, even quarreling amongst yourselves, killing other Yakuza, highly discouraged. Um, and that preserves public order in some ways because the criminal element uh, is put into, joins an organization that keeps them from creating street crime. It doesn't stop them from doing blackmail and extortion and collecting protection money, but it does stop, uh, but does make sure that the streets are relatively safe. They are what is called Kisha clubs, reporters clubs. In every single government agency, and in regionally, and in the police, there is a space designated for reporters. In the old days, actually, the government actually paid for all the expenses. Now we you know, reporters paid ourselves. And you are in the police headquarters. Uh, you socialize with the police. You have, you have a certain amount of access to them. Uh, there was a time when actually you could walk into the detective's room, um, you know, uh, without permission. Uh, that faded after the Saline attacks in 1995. Um, so yeah, you are embedded. You spend a lot of time with the police if you're a police reporter. And if you're smart, you try and cultivate sources outside of the police uh, force as well so that you have some information that they don't have that you can trade for a scoop. Um, and you also have to drink a lot with them and smoke. Uh, I, I'm probably one of the only people who took up smoking at 35 because when I got put on the police beat, 
uh, in Tokyo, um, they had just banned smoking in the detectives' rooms. So they built these kind of makeshift smoking booths on each floor where all the detectives went to smoke. Um, and I realized if I'm going to hang out with the cops and pick up police gossip, I need to be in this room. So uh, the only thing I could stand as a cigarette were clove cigarettes because they were sweet. And I didn't realize how much nicotine they had in them and how powerful they were. So, you know, I, I, I smoked them for years. Um, the, the last parts of this book were, were finished, I think, uh, the book was kind of rushed to print. I, I smoked 15 packs of clove cigarettes in 10 days, uh, and then I was sick for like three weeks. Here's the, here's the nice thing about clove cigarettes. It, it, <laughs> when you smoke a clove cigarette, it, you leave like, the scent is so powerful that it tells other reporters that you've been there. And I actually had a reporter like once come to me and go like, I, oh my God, like what are you writing? Because I was just in the environmental department and I could smell your cigarettes through there. Like, are you working on another scoop about dioxin? I'm like, like what can I say? <laughs> what Yakuza say, because you know, there's so much, because they don't live very long and there's a lot of deaths, is they like, oh, we love the smell of your clove cigarettes. It smells like the, the incense they light at a, at a funeral, at a temple. Uh, uh, and you know, and, and actually, they find that soothing rather than disturbing. Go figure. <laughs> Here are the rules of, of, of writing about organized crime in Japan. Uh, there, you know, there are two kinds. There are yakuza journalists that make a living writing for yakuza fan magazines, and they're very limited in what they can write about the yakuza. Uh, they have to write sort of praiseworthy articles. They have to defend the yakuza in print. Um, they almost always have a yakuza benefactor. Uh, the actual base pay isn't very good, but when you conduct an interview with the Yakuza boss for you know, transportation expenses, they can give you between $5,000 to $30,000 for the article. Um, that makes it a lucrative occupation. Uh, and you know, Yakuza fan magazines may not have uh, a, a great circulation, but you know, because the Yakuza are sort of paying for it to exist as propaganda materials for them, and also recruiting materials, uh, they manage to get by. Uh, and, and then there's real journalists, investigative journalists, who write about the Yakuza, and then that's a whole other ballgame. Okay. That would be a, a Yakuza investigative journalist. Um, that would be Suzuki Tomohiko, uh, Mizoguchi Atsushi, and that's a more dangerous occupation. Uh, Mizoguchi-san had his son stabbed in 2006 when he wrote a number of articles that touched upon the actual financial operations of the, of the Yamaguchi Gumi. Um, there was the uh, famous film director Itami Juzo made a movie about the Yakuza in 1992 that was the first realistic depiction of them as extortionist and con artist uh, and unpleasant people and the response of uh, the Godo Gumi which was loosely depicted in that film was to send five people to his house and they sl basically sliced open his face. Um, so when you report about the Yakuza as they really are uh, it can be a dangerous occupation. Um, and even Mizuguchi Yasushi, who now writes for Yakuza fan magazines at the same time because they've been forced to sort of confront the realities, um, he's always careful to sort of say, you know, not all Yakuza are bad, but these bad Yakuza are spoiling it for everybody. And there's some truth to that. Um, in the old days, there was a code of behavior that the Japanese mafia um, upheld uh, sort of universally. So that, they sort of, so that they were tolerated within society, and lately they have not been observing those rules. Uh, I am definitely on the investigative journalist side. At the same time, um, there are two or three Yakuza who are, uh, I consider them my friends. And, uh, you know, I'm probably not going to write something that's bad-mouthing their organization. There's a lot of things I could write. Um, you need some allies in the world. It's not a smart thing to piss off everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, while I'm not going to write articles saying what wonderful people they are, I'm also probably not going to write anything that's really critical of them. That's Yakuza politics. Here's the Yakuza in, in, uh, in summarized in three or four minutes. Uh, think of them as criminal trade associations legally rec recognized by the Japanese government. There are 86,000 of them. 23 major 22 major organizations. The Yamaguchi Gumi is the largest with 40,000 members, kind of like the Tesco of organized crime. Uh, the Sumi Yoshikai with 12,000 members, uh, based mostly in Tokyo, is the second largest. The Inagawa Kai with 10,000 members is the third 
largest organized crime group, and they're also fairly Tokyo-based. Um, they exist out in the open. They have offices. They have business cards. They have fan magazines. Everyone knows who the top bosses are. Um, the Japanese government regulates them, and there are laws uh, restricting their behavior, but as criminal organizations themselves, they are not banned. And it is very difficult for the police to do an investigation that goes all the way up to the top. Um, it's just problems within the Japanese law itself. There's no plea bargaining, uh, very limited wiretapping, no witness protection program, no witness relocation program, um, uh, all, uh, no undercover work allowed. I mean, I mean, it's possible, but almost impossible in, in reality if you look at the laws. Uh, what that means is that the Japanese police are never able to really destroy the Yakuza because if you get someone on the lower branches, they're never going to rat out their boss. Why will they not rat out their boss? Because one, uh, there's no advantage to it for them. They're not going to get a lighter sentence. And since their lawyer will probably be employed by the Yakuza group to which they belong to, any statement they make to the police is going to be taken to their boss who will look at it and know that they have cooperated with the cops. And in which case, they will either disappear while they're on bail, or they will sh die in prison, or they'll be killed when they get out of prison. But if they keep their mouths shut, uh, they get a cash reward, um, a bonus upon leaving prison, and a promotion when they get out. Um, and that is how the Yakuza make sure that the investigations never go to the top. Uh, when a Yakuza boss wants someone killed, he never orders it. He just sort of obliquely makes a reference to it. Uh, this happened to a Yakuza friend of mine when he was still very young. The, the boss made a remark about a certain city council member he didn't like. And since my friend was very smart, he immediately said to the boss, oh, so do you want me to whack him? Do you want me to kill him? And the boss was like, you know, shaking his head. No, no, uh, that's not what I'm saying. And, and, and that was the end of the discussion. Because he knows that as soon as it's made clear that it's an order, that the boss isn't, isn't interested anymore because now the trail of evidence could lead to him. So they're very smart. Um, uh, there's a book that was an ex memoir, uh, a memoir of an ex Yakuza boss who is in that book, Goro Tadamasa. This, uh, in this book, in, in May of this year, he published his own memoirs, and he says a similar thing about me, which is, it doesn't make me happy when there's kind of like a, a, a Yakuza fatwa out on me in Japan, just when I thought things were going back to normal.